Okay, let me welcome you to this panel, which has the, uh, the name Government Open and Shut, Transparency, Privacy, and Mass Surveillance. And we're going to deal with two aspects of the issue of the government gathering information relating to individuals' privacy. First, we'll look at uh, the issue of government surveillance, particularly secret surveillance in the national security area. And then uh, we'll look at the question of what limits there should be on the government's release of information uh, re which re relates to individuals and might affect uh, their privacy. But we're gonna, I'm gonna ask each of the speakers uh, to introduce themselves to make sure I don't reveal anything about them that they don't want revealed. And we're gonna begin with an announcement. CEO of the Open Knowledge Foundation. And I'm delighted to announce that thanks to funding from the Open Society Foundations, together with the Open Rights Group, we're going to be working on a project over the next year to explore issues of open data, personal data, and privacy. And I encourage you all to get involved. We're going to be tweeting the link out where you can sign up for our mailing list. We're going to be engaging the broadest community, bringing together the open data and open government folks, and the privacy and personal data folks, and those in government, civil society, and industry working in these spaces to discuss these issues and start to work towards some best practice principles and hopefully some educational materials as well. So I encourage you to sign up, and thanks to OSF for helping us get this project started. Good, thank you. So I'm Morton Halperin. I'm a senior advisor at the um, Open Society Foundation. Uh, and I bring to this what I think may be, and if there's somebody here who wants to contradict it, please stand up. I think I may be the only person in the room who knows that he was subject to surveillance by a, a U.S. government intelligence agency. Uh, and I'd be, uh, I think that has to some extent shaped my own view uh, of this. So, uh, Ian, do you want to start? Yep. Um, I'm Ian Brown from Oxford University, uh, where I do research on internet regulation, particularly related to security and privacy standards. Um, unlike Mort, as far as I know, I haven't been on a, an enemies list. Um, I think having been on Nixon's enemies list is, is um, something to be quite proud of. Um, I'm just going to briefly uh, kick off the discussion to, uh, looking at opportunities for transnational human rights standards for surveillance. The panel this morning, if you were, if you were just before lunch <coughs> listening to Mort and Frank LaRue and others um, discussing some related issues, I think made the important point that most of the momentum for change when it comes to national security programs will have to come um, from the bottom up at the national level because it, that's where governments will be persuaded. But having said that, I think there are opportunities not just within the OGP process but in a, uh, a number of other international fora where civil society and um, people uh, advocating the, the better protection of human rights within surveillance programs can make progress. So let me just say a little bit about where those are in, in three groups. Um, first, thinking about what, what might be the source of those principles, then uh, where are these specifically transatlantic opportunities for change? Because obviously the discussions between the US and the, and the EU have become very uh, heated, uh, especially in the last couple of weeks over, over this. Um, but then thirdly, to look a little, bit, a little bit more globally. So first of all, clearly there are already very good principles in uh, at both at the national level and the international level that we can draw on. It's not that, uh, as, as interesting and perhaps slightly novel as some of the large-scale interception programs that have been revealed are from a technological perspective, I don't know that they, they raise significantly new human rights issues. Of course, within Europe, there's the European Convention on Human Rights, where there have been a number of cases since the 70s considering state use of, of large-scale uh, communication surveillance equipment. Of course, the, uh, the US Constitution and the interpretation of it um, has a lot to say about that, and it may be that now that so much more is known concretely about what the National Security Agency is doing, that some of the court cases that people like the ACLU and the EFF have brought in the US courts, which had stalled until now, um, because the court said you have no concrete proof, um, unlike Mort, that uh, you, were being, um, you were being put under surveillance. Uh, well, clearly now they do, so we, we might see movement there. But um, first of all, Jim is going to talk more about these, so I won't say too much, but civil society groups over the last few months together have put together 
uh, a very good set of international principles on the application of human rights to communication sur surveillance. So I think that's uh, a very positive set to start with. They have very broad consensus. I think actually within, certainly within Europe and probably within North America at the very least, we can go further because uh, we're building on perhaps reasonably high standards if they were enforced um, uh, to take those further. Uh, within Europe, um, the European Data Protection Supervisor, who is an official that's responsible for monitoring EU institutions' own compliance with human rights, with, particularly with the Charter of Fundamental Rights and with Data Protection Directive standards, um, has published um, a review of the proposals for the EU-US data sharing agreement, which I think has some very useful points in. Um, at a higher level, of course, the uh, UN Human Rights Committee has published a number of general comments over the years on the uh, interpretation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, protection of privacy uh, in the context of new technology. The Human Rights Committee is now considering um, developing a new general comment that would say more specifically in that, uh, in, in that area how to interpret the ICCPR. Also, Germany and a number of other European allies have proposed that the Human Rights Council develop a new optional protocol to the ICCPR where they would try to set out in detail how that instrument applies in the area of foreign intelligence operations, which in the past has been something where states have by and large chosen to look the other way. Um, that's one reason that despite the avalanche of uh, revelations over the summer at the state level, there's been relatively slow, slow movement, although it was very interesting to see John Kerry yesterday here say by video link that he th even he thought that the, uh, the NSA had gone too far on autopilot, if you like. I think that, that, that no doubt explains a lot of what we now know. I don't, I don't think there was any malicious intent in what was going on in developing all these new surveillance capabilities. Why wouldn't you if you had those kind of budgets and um, that kind of technological capability uh, behind you? I'm sure it was geek heaven at, uh, at the NSA and at GCHQ uh, developing all of these, uh, all of these systems. Secondly, um, the EU is both in the process of negotiating the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the US and has some existing data, share, data sharing agreements. Uh, in particular, um, the, uh, it's commonly known as the SWIFT agreement, um, the terrorist financing program, I think the US government calls it tracking program, uh, where SWIFT, which is the interbank consortium of hundreds of banks around the world, which uh, allow banks to s allow banks customers to send payments between them, um, and which um, there is now a, uh, there's a specific agreement regulating access by the U.S. government to messages going between those SWIFT consortium members because their their system is in Euro is physically in in Europe one of the main systems for pass passing those messages. Um, it turned out, of course, over the summer that the NSA was hacking that system anyway. So even though there's this legitimate legitimized uh, route for the US Treasury to get access to uh, these financial transfer messages. Um, the NSA was going around that and, and hacking the systems to get them directly. And, and following that, the uh, European Parliament uh, just last week voted to suspend that agreement. Nothing is going to happen soon as a consequence of that vote because um, it would still take agreement by the European Commission and the European Council, i.e. the member states, I don't think the UK will be voting for that anytime soon. I don't know how aggressively the other member states, particularly Germany and France, that have been uh, making public statements that they were upset about this, uh, would push anything there. The other main data sharing agreement that the Parliament has made noises about suspending, although not gone so far as with the SWIFT agreement, is on uh, the passenger name records, so the records of flight, flight data, flight passenger data. Um, and there's also uh, the safe harbor agreement, which allows companies in the UK to transfer, sorry, in Europe, to transfer personal data to the US, to, to companies there that have signed up to this voluntary safe harbor agreement, which has now been strongly criticized by some members of the European Parliament uh, and which the European Commission is reviewing. They said they would announce by the end of this year. Um, I would be surprised if the European Commission decides it would like to suspend the safe harbor agreement because it potentially would have a very big economic impact. Having said that, some, some of the non-usual suspects in the European Parliament, so not mm -hmm. just the Greens and the, the Liberals that have made a lot of noise on this, but even some of the Conservatives have been saying that they think the safe harbor agreement should be uh, suspended. Lastly, uh, and 
moving out from that, that narrow EU focus. First of all, the Council of Europe, which is the uh, 47 state um, organization which is responsible for the European Convention on Human Rights has been doing a lot of work for a number of years now on internet governance and internet freedom. Uh, they, uh, just a couple of months back, had, had a big meeting on transparency, so back, back to the theme directly of this uh, conference overall, um, transparency in terms of uh, both the private sector companies that are holding a lot of the user data that governments are interested in, in terms of the, the levels of requests those companies are getting for user data, in terms of broad outlines of the kind of access that governments have to that data. And on the government side, of course, you can go about this the two different ways. You can ask companies individually to sign up to transparency commitments, as the global network initiative companies all do, as Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Facebook now publish these transparency reports. Of course, the people that have the comp comprehensive data are the governments that are making the, the, the requests for the user data in the first place, so encouraging uh, governments to sign up to that. So I think something, some interesting things will definitely come out of that Council of Europe uh, process. Um, I already mentioned the, the Human Rights Council and Committee at the UN. The other key global body, of course, where there might be standard setting is the Internet Governance Forum. Although that is by design a body that's all about dialogue, not about making recommendations or coming to agreements and setting standards, uh, the meeting that was just held in Indonesia of that forum uh, a week or two ago, there was a great deal of discussion of these issues, as you might, might expect. And I think because so many countries um, not just those like Russia and China that want to see much stronger governmental control of internet governance, but also countries like Brazil and India that have been uh, rather unhappy, understandably, about what they feel is ex their exclusion from um, the ability to set standards when it comes to things like the domain name system where the US government still does have a lot of sway over the operation of the Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers. Uh, and so I think particularly significant between ICANN and the IGF will be the big summit that Brazil and ICANN are now planning in Rio in April. So I'm very interested to see what comes out of that. Thanks. Jim? Well, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, what I wanted to talk about today was um, the, as Ian mentioned, the uh, international principles on the application of human rights to communications surveillance, uh, or more snappily, necessary and proportionate .org. So, if you go to necessary and proportionate .org, that gives you the uh, 13 principles that civil society uh, and others have identified for. Uh, the application of surveillance. Um, and I think there are some particular uh, things for open government there, and I'll go into those in, in a second, but just a, I think very, very briefly right at the start, it's worth asking what has surveillance oversight got to do with open government? Uh, given that this is the secret state, um, many people I'm sure will think that this is the antithesis of anti, of, of uh, open government, the one place that openness may not always be able to touch. Um, maybe it isn't relevant to open government in, in the views of some. And certainly from the sort of UK experience, I think that is the default position of our administrations. Um, but I think the last six months shows you what happens when you have surveillance without sufficient transparency. Uh, uh, it creates risks uh, for both the state and citizens, and it undermines confidence. Uh, it undermines the public trust when information leaks out. That's a risk for government. Um, other risks for government include that partner states become less trusting of each other. Um, necessary surveillance programs may become difficult to run if uh, public confidence is undermined. Uh, state surveillance can accumulate too much power, of course, and that becomes uh, open to abuse. And again, that is a problem for government. Um, but ultimately, if this isn't done right, then uh, states fail in their custodianship of our democratic cultures and they undermine the relationship between state and citizens. Therefore, sufficient transparency, I think, is absolutely critical to the running of any uh, state surveillance schemes for whatever reasons. Uh, for citizens, the risks are perhaps more immediate. They are things like the capabilities of the state running riot as data grows and the processes around data become more powerful. Um, we are denied information which is 
uh, which we need in order to judge whether what is being done in our name is appropriate and reasonable, we can be placed at unnecessary risk. Uh, we may find ourselves unable to resolve complaints. And of course, citizens may fear the potential of the surveillance apparatus around them. All of these are very significant impacts, and they can, at least to some extent, be dealt with by um, transparency principles, um, which are at the heart of open government. Um, so I'll just, just sort of try to uh, talk a little bit about what the principles are. Um, as Ian mentioned, they're not hugely new principles. It's not that the principles themselves can't be found in plenty of other places in, in other ways. This is a codification that's there for us in the current debate, all of us to start assessing whether our states are living up to the principles that uh, human rights advocates, lawyers, uh, people writing international treaties have tried to, um, to, to put in place for many, many decades. Um, the most important open government principle, I think, is that of legality. Um, this is one of the 13 principles mentioned in this statement. Legality is important. Um, we need a clear legal framework in our member states, in, in our states, uh, which is not vague or incomprehensible. The, the statement says that um, should have, we should have publicly available legislative acts which meet a standard of clarity and precision that is sufficient to ensure that individuals have advance notice of and can foresee uh, the application of surveillance. I don't think either the UK or the US law currently would pass that test. In the UK, we have um, RIPA, which is more or less incomprehensible. Uh, you know, in terms of reading, it's very extremely hard to interpret. Um, but also, looking at schemes like uh, the Tempora project to sweep up 30% of the traffic of the internet uh, off on cables just outside of the UK, I don't think that was foreseeable from uh, the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. Similarly. Um, secret courts in the states under FISA, I don't see that that's something that you can foresee uh, what is intended by that because uh, the courts operate in secret, the regimes are secret, how therefore are you meant to understand what FISA means in practice? Um, you know, to, to be completely clear about this, we had debates about what FISA meant. We had Casper uh, Bowden, an expert who's now on our, our advisory council, trying to explain what he thought this meant. He said it meant mass um, political surveillance and people kind of looked at him as if he was slightly crazy. I mean, it was very, very hard to, for people to understand precisely what it meant. Second uh, open government principle uh, in necessaryandproportionate.org uh, expressed there is that of user notification. Uh, that is to say, when data is obtained and used for investigations, in most circumstances, uh, the, the person who's been investigated should be notified. Now, user notification exists in a number of legal regimes in, in, in different places, in, in parts of the of US law, not, not under the sort of FISA and Patriot Act stuff, but elsewhere. Uh, I believe the Netherlands also does a lot of user notification. It doesn't happen in the UK at all, of course. But the advantage to, to this from an open society, open government kind of perspective is that if abuses are occurring, the individuals get to know. In the UK at the moment, when you complain about surveillance, you have to guess that you're under surveillance, complain to the relevant authority, um, and hope that they don't think you're paranoid. Um, and then you, if they check check it out and find out uh, that you are under surveillance, then then great. But you know you've had to uh, you you pretty much have to guess that that's happening. Uh, you don't simply know. The next principle to, um, I want to highlight is that of transparency. Um, that's to say, states should be transparent about the use and scope of communication surveillance techniques and powers. They should publish aggregate information on the number of, of requests approved and rejected. They should uh, provide disaggregation of requests by service provider and investigation type and purpose. That's quite detailed, but it doesn't need to pose a threat to national security to know this kind of information. Uh, we should, states should also provide individuals with sufficient information to enable them to un fully comprehend the scope, nature and application of the laws uh, committing communication surveillance. This is a very much an open government matter and this kind of information pro can provide um, the basis for a legitimate debate about whether surveillance powers are being used appropriately or not. The final principle I want to just uh, highlight a little quickly is um, that of the integrity of communications and systems. This speaks to things like the undermining of uh, 
of uh, encryption techniques, building back doors into software like um, Outlook or, uh, or uh, Skype, Th things that we know are, are happening um, now, we're, through the revelations that we've heard. The reason that it's important for people to know that these activities are taking place, um, or in fact, more to the point, that they aren't taking place, that states simply should not be doing these things, is because they um, undermine our basic security. And we should not be saying as a society that individual security uh, should be removed in order to increase the power of the state to deal with specific um, national security abuses because that's a widespread effect on everybody um, that is not necessary or proportionate. So um, that's important for trust. Um, and as I say, I don't think the UK, well, the UK and the US have not passed that test. Um, so we need that's something we need to know from states. So those are things that from the point of view of open government, uh, the kinds of things we need to know from government, the kinds of information that government needs to supply to citizens in order to have um, a reasonable debate uh, and to constrain surveillance powers appropriately. Okay, we'll come back to this in the discussion. David's going to transition us. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to do a, a supposedly a transition from surveillance to privacy and how you balance that with right to information, but I don't actually think it's as dramatic a transition as it might seem to be. Uh, we spent this panel and the panel before lunch talking about uh, surveillance and openness and national security and how you make the state accountable. Uh, and that really does relate to privacy. If you look at the two things, the, the old cliche that I hate to use is that, that there are two sides of the same coin. But they're really both about bringing accountability to the state to empower the individual to have a right to protect themselves, to protect their fundamental integrity uh, by being able to keep information about themselves that is personal and sensitive uh, and damaging in their own individual circumstances. At the same time, making sure that the state is open, that the state is not abusing its powers, that it is not, uh, or companies are not abusing their powers. Uh, because they have more control over us. How, how we, as citizens, the, the power balance is, is slightly uh, less unbalanced. So when we're talking about privacy, and in this case, it's really we're talking about personal data rather than privacy as, as part of uh, surveillance or any other kinds of uh, different aspects that there are, uh, it's important to look at these kinds of, of uh, overlaps. So it really does come down to sort of two questions. Uh, the first is, what are the rights of us as individuals to know about what other people hold on us, whether it's corporations or government bodies uh, or any kinds of other entities that are out there? And the second is, uh, what others should know about us? So the first question I think is fairly easy, uh, relatively easy, I should say. Nothing is easy. Uh, but it's, it's really one where the two rights do come together in a very uh, synergistic way. The right for us to know what other people are holding about us. So privacy laws, data protection laws in Europe, privacy laws in, in, in America, uh, such as they are, as we've discovered, maybe not so good as we thought they were, uh, give individuals a fundamental right to access information held by government bodies. You can demand your record from somebody, from a government body. You may not get it because there's lots of exemptions. There's lots of exemptions in FOI too. Uh, but at least in the European context, you have a much more fundamental right under the European Convention on Human Rights, supposedly under the ICCPR also, to, to get full access to your records, except in the most extraordinary cases. Uh, and this strongly overlaps with uh, the right to information. In many cases, it's the same law that allows you to do both. People use the right to information law because they want to know stuff about themselves. A lot of the cases you hear where right to information is very successful in places like India, it's actually being used almost as a privacy law. It's about people demanding to know why their government services haven't been provided to them, why they haven't received their, 
their food subsidy or their identity card or their housing allowance. And it's really demanding from the government to know, uh, in my particular case, why haven't I received it? Uh, so you have to look at it. It is a right to information thing, but it's also from an international human rights perspective, it's a privacy issue. It's about the subject access, uh, individuals' access to their own records. If you're thinking about it in the context of surveillance, it's what kinds of rights as individuals do we have to know what GCHQ or NSA or MI5 or the CIA or whoever has on us and how that then brings accountability to them, knowing that you can access your own record and show that they've abused it in some way, knowing that they've intercepted your mail, wiretapped your phone, bugged your house, broken into something. Now, these are not entirely theoretical cases. Uh, we know lots of experience in the past uh, where this has happened. And it's, if you look at the context of Europe, a lot of freedom of information laws were adopted because people wanted, it was about the dealing with the secret police files in Eastern Europe. A lot of demand for right to information laws in Europe came from the demand to know what was in those secret police files. So to be able in, in I mean, Germany had a very good law on, on that, uh, which led to many people being able to access uh, their own records to find out who was spying on them, what was said about them, why they were lost their jobs, uh, turns out their neighbors or their lovers were spying on them far too often. Uh, but that's, you know, something that needs to be addressed. So it's about, you know, the accountability that led to that. Now, the harder question is, what do we get to know about other people? What is it, within the context of right to information and privacy, do government bodies, do corporate bodies, uh, are they allowed to, what kinds of restrictions do they have to collect that information, but also then what kinds of uh, restrictions do they have on being able to disclose that information? And in this case, you have to look at it as a balancing of human rights, because privacy under international human rights law is a fundamental human right. Yes, it's abused in many different ways in many different countries misused, misrepresented, and so on as an excuse not to make information public. But ultimately, information about individuals that's personally identifiable and reveals something about their personal lives is personal information and is covered under the rubric of data protection. So it's about the balance. How do you balance those two rights? Uh, so the key question then is, what is the public interest in making the information available? There's lots of different sort of you know, uh, ways of sort of uh, addressing it. Uh, for instance, you can look at it and say, OK, if you're a public official, then you have less privacy rights in some aspects. If you're a senior official, a president, you have even less private rights. There's plenty of case law at the European Court of Human Rights and even at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights that says, if you're a public official and you do something that does affect your public uh, activities, then that should be, even if it would otherwise be personal information, it can be made public or should be made public. You know, we've seen in the last couple of years, five or six presidents die in office and then not tell the public about it. So we're currently litigating a case in Mexico where we're trying to find out the medical records of the president because he suddenly mysteriously went into the hospital. Yes, medical records should ordinarily be extraordinarily protected. But on the other hand, uh, if it's the president and there's a constitutional crisis, the public also has a right to know about his health condition, maybe not every detail, not every x-ray, not every CAT scan, but they do need to know uh, because that, uh, directly affects the democracy of the country. So if we tie this back now into uh, the whole surveillance issue, it becomes a very uh, is difficult issue that was addressed in many countries like Germany and Bulgaria and Czech Republic after 1992. How do you make uh, public 
the information about the security services and their misdeeds. You know, what is the boundary of what you make public? And that's a difficult question to answer. You can't just sort of set one answer and say nothing. And clearly you have to look at things like, uh, do you release a list of victims, people who were wiretapped? Or do you list what it was that the conversations were? I think that's a fairly easy boundary. It's one thing to say somebody's been a victim of the secret police, but you don't victimize them again by making public some personal secrets that were revealed in a phone conversation. Uh, but there's a lot of sort of gray areas that can be teased out in that. So that's one of those things that's quite interesting where these two areas do come together. Uh, and in terms of you know, how we move forward on this, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that OSF is, is funding this project to look at this balance of personal data and, and, uh, and privacy. And you know, I hope they you know, think about some basic principles about, about how you balance the rights uh, you look at the public interest, you try and develop some examples. There's a lot of uh, freedom of information laws that do have set out reasonably well some of the public interest boundaries that can be used, uh, which I think would be very useful uh, to tease out and to sort of develop some international consensus on. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going want to <coughs> want to explore how dead presidents report to their population that they've died. But uh, we'll come to that Their later. aides. Okay. Nice. Okay. Thank you, Morton. I'm Jacqueline Pichard. I'm uh, Information Commissioner from Mexico. Uh, the Information Commission in Mexico, the federal one, because there's one Information Commission at every state level, but the federal one, which is, uh, I'm a member of this uh, commission, is in charge not only of um, requests of information and making sure that public information is released, but is also in charge of data protection, both in the public and in the private sector. So uh, what I want to, to talk about is some of the cases we've dealt with in which there is a tension between both human rights. In the Mexican Constitution has, uh, has stated that both access to information and um, personal data protection, not only privacy, but personal data protection, are human rights. So what the commission has to do when there is a tension, I mean, in one information request, when there is tension between what should be public and what should be personal data and then considered as uh, confident record or confident information, then uh, the commission has uh, the right to uh, see the balance between one and the other right and then just decide where the public interest to prioritize the public interest and then say whether the information should be released or not. So I do think that um, what the commission has tried to do is trying to harmonize both rights if possible. For example, if there is a document where you have public information, government information, and at the same time you have some personal data, then we come up with a version of the document in which the personal data are covered so as to protect personal data but give away the rest of the information. For example, in a police report that is finished, that, I mean, the people were convicted, for example, then you may say, okay, I'm going to give away the, the report, the police report, but I am not going to give away, for example, uh, those who were, um, were part of the investigation, who were asked as uh, witnesses, then we keep those names, um, I mean, we don't give them away, so that we keep them secret so as to protect part of their, of their names. Um, so I do think I'm convinced that in dealing with the tension between access to information, that is between transparency and privacy, you have to go case by case, that is analyze it and then try to find the balance. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about uh, one or two cases we have dealt with and how we have come up with what we think is the best uh, public interest and what we have decided. 
Now, one of the major challenges that we faced is uh, what regards to uh, social programs, for example, to alleviate poverty in Mexico. Well, you, we have the list, the register of the people that according to certain criteria from these social programs, the social programs must have specific aims, specific objectives, and then they must build on the register of the people that fill in with those criteria. So um, there is a register of the people that are going to receive any funds from the state regarding these social programs, for example, to alleviate poverty. And then, for example, the, for the agencies that have to uh, find out whether the program was properly carried out, that is, those who evaluate the program, obviously they have access to this register, the register of the specific people that receive aid from government through these uh, programs. But when it comes to somebody else, I mean, a member, a journalist, for example, that says, I want to find out what the names of those benefited from uh, these uh, social programs, whether, uh, who are they, where they are located, in what kind of communities, I mean, to find out who the people are, then what we have said is, okay, it's a social program, it, it's public money, government money that is going to benefit the people, the specific people that are marginalized and must fill in certain requirements. And we have said, okay, uh, the principle about this list is that we should not give away their names, that is their na the names of the people benefited through these social programs should have the right to have their names kept confidential, right? So as not to be, I mean, object of uh, discrimination, for example. But on the other hand, when we have in Mexico particularly, we've seen that this type of social programs that involve lots of uh, government money sometimes are used politically by the governments, I mean, the state and the federal governments. So we analyze it and we said, what is more important to protect the confidentiality of the names of the people that are benefited through these social programs or to give away the, the, the registers because it's important for everybody to keep track of how public money is being released through specific social programs so that they are not politically used. I mean, because this use, this political use of social programs is not something extraordinary, but it's a, it has been generally a rule in my country. So what we said was the names of the people, of the, the register of the people benefited from these uh, social programs should be given away. Now, I know that this is controversial. It's not easy to deal with things like this because obviously you give away names and then everybody will know that you are part of this marginalized community that is benefited by this social program. But anyway, we thought it was more important to have many eyes that is uh, scrutinized uh, these programs so as to make sure that they are not misused. So it's not only uh, the, uh, I mean, the the government agency that has the right to supervise the program, but it's everybody's uh, knowledge of who are the people that are being benefited. I mean, this has become such, um, it has been so much accepted in Mexico that uh, Congress actually in the uh, budget decree every year has stated that all social programs should release the list of the beneficiaries from these programs. So it has become a law. So uh, everybody knows that if you are part of these uh, social programs of the registers, then your name is going to be released. Now, um, uh, I'm gonna tell you about another case that we got, and then I would like to comment on something that David just said about the medical record of the president. Uh, but, okay, the other case, which is, it has certain similarity, there was um, a big accident in Mexico about three years ago in a nursery in the northern part of Mexico, and uh, 
uh, about uh, more than 30 children, 30 kids died under the, the age of six because of the accident. There was a fire and so in the nursery. And as a result of this, of this accident, then the government had to give away, uh, give away resources, economic and medical resources, to the families of the kids that were injured or that were deceased through this uh, big uh, fire, I mean, the, the nursery came to fire. So uh, there was a request of information saying, I want to know the names of every relative that received support from the government so as to, let's say, make up for the tragedy. And we want to know exactly how much each relative received from the government, right? So it had to do with uh, transparency, with making no and um, publicize how much money was given to everyone that had been part of this, uh, of this uh, ter terrible tragedy. Now, obviously there were names, the family names, the relatives of the kids that had been deceased or injured. And so what we had to do was trying to balance whether giving away the information of the families that had already had such a great pain and then being publicized as part of that. So we said, okay, we're not going to release the name of the kids, but we are going to release the name of the adults involved. So uh, no names of kids, names of adults, and obviously the specific amounts because the government only wanted to give the overall amount that was given to all the families and relatives that had been uh, part of this uh, tragedy. So, uh, so we, we, we said the names of the kids that die should be kept uh, uh, confidential, but not the particular amount that was given to every family, right? So as to find out whether the families that received the money were the families that should have received it and not somebody that was uh, in the governor's interest. Well, I, I'll finally come to, to this uh, thing about the medical record of the president. I know that, uh, as uh, David said, that it's controversial, right? Uh, that is, uh, should everybody know what the medical record is if he has, uh, I don't know, if he had a hepatitis in the past or even if he has diabetes or whatever? I mean, um, should you give away the medical record because he's a president? Well, what we've said, and we've got this uh, request of information, and we said the important thing is whether he can have a good performance as a president or whether the illness that he goes through is part of his privacy, part of his private life, and if this illness is not visibly affecting his uh, performance as president, I do think that, or we thought, I mean the board, the commission thought, that uh, this medical record should not be released. And those were our arguments. Our arguments were, okay, everybody has the right to have his own medical records concealed from the rest of the public, and even if it's the president, only if there is some affection towards his uh, um, performance. So we, we said that it shouldn't be given away, and I just want to state that uh, the resolutions from the commission are mandatory for government agencies, and government agencies cannot appeal before the courts our resolutions. So it's definite, so we have to take a lot of, uh, I mean, attention and really balance very carefully what we're doing Obviously, the individuals, the individuals affected by our resolution may go to court and obviously appeal our resolution, but only particulars can do that. Thank you. So I like the notion of the power to order the government to release the material. All right, the floor is open for uh, comments, questions. Yes. Would you wait for the microphone? Great, then Could I can get to say it all again. Yes. For those of you who are not immediately adjacent to me, 
<laughs> My name is David Goldberg and I work for the Campaign for Freedom of Information in the UK generally, but specifically in Scotland. Uh, could I just open as a sort of general, and it is Friday afternoon, which is maybe a good or a bad time to do it, sort of conceptual philosophical discussion about the notion of balancing, which I've had difficulty with for decades, because <laughs> I think it's absolutely pointless and totally useless as an aid to figuring out what to do in these kind of situations, but also in human rights jurisprudence generally. It's got all the spurious sort of, you know, attractiveness of some kind of solemn, 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 I'm trying to think of Solomon, you know, Solomonic, you know, weighing up Solomonic type wisdom. It's got the scales of justice on the, you know, courts of law here at the Old Bailey. It's got a spurious connection to a sort of quantitative, you know, I just watched the Great British Bake Off. You know, you can put so much flour in one bit of the scales and so many raisins in the other and you can figure out a balance. I just think it's completely useless. I appeal for us to drop it and just to agree that all we're trying to do with each other is persuade each other through argument what should be done. End of. Thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Kido Strack. I'm a whistleblower from Germany. And uh, I would like to share some real life experience with the European Union and the European Commission. Uh, I tried to get access to my own file, and privacy was held against me. So my own privacy was used as an argument against me. <laughs> I referred to three different legal reasons to have access to my files. One is the statute of officials of the European Commission. Uh, one is uh, data laws and the other is the Freedom of Information Act, which is Regulation 1049 or 2001 on EU level. And uh, the Commission it very efficiently managed to switch from one to the other and in the end to turn down my request saying that I didn't follow the correct procedure. So first they told me I should do it as an official, so not based on the Freedom of Information Act. And then the, the court decided that, and the court played a role in that as well, the court decided saying that I should have used the Freedom of Information Act, the delays of which had been turned down. I made experience with the, um, <coughs> the Ombudsman, the European Ombudsman, who in eight cases, I repeat eight, found that the commission violated my Freedom of Information rights. And then he said, uh, yes, but uh, I'm not going to make a report to, you, to the European Parliament. Please make another request. The law has changed, evolved, there's new jurisdiction, so make another request. I made that other request. So the initial request was from 2004. I made this other request, and then it was turned by the Commission, turned down by the Commission <laughs> as an illegal secondary request, as non-admissible. And the, uh, the president of the commission was asked in parliament if they ever did that. And he said, yeah, we did it only in one case, which wasn't mine. So apparently this case doesn't, doesn't seem to exist. I sued the commission and the European court in 2008. And since 2008, there hasn't even been a hearing of that case. So that's the reality of freedom of information in Europe. And you can also see that on uh, asktheeu.org, uh, asking there for my name, which is S-T-R-A-C-K. And then you find freedom of information requests from friends of mine who were played by the commission as well, uh, according to the same rules. Another experience is uh, the um, Bavarian Lager decision of the, of the European Court of Justice, which said that um, the, uh, you can't access the names of representatives of companies in official committees of the European, consulting committees of the European Commission. That's privacy. In one of my cases, I asked for the names of commission officials and it was turned down as privacy. This one is an op on appeal now at the European Court of Justice. Mm. Um, and beside that, I, I then made an appeal to the European Court in Strasbourg and this was turned down as inadmissible as well because as a, as a European official, I don't have European uh, um, Court in Strasbourg protecting my rights as besides all 28 member states of the EU being member of the court and of this institution, 
um, they don't look at violations by the EU as the EU isn't member, even so it's now four years that the, uh, the um, Lisbon Treaty says that the EU should become member. So uh, one last example, I made a request to access my data in, 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 in OLAF, at, uh, at OLAF, which is the anti-fraud commission of, of uh, the European uh, Commission or institutions. And uh, when I get back, they told me, yes, we co we've got your name, we've got your address, and we've got your, uh, your affiliation in the job, that's it. So that was the re answer to the, the, my request to get access to my file. And then I complained to the EDPS, the European Data Protection Supervisor, who uh, apparently made some arrangements with Olaf. Later on, I got now five tables from Olaf where they list every document in which my data appears and they still say, yeah, in this document there appears your name and uh, there appears your address or some, something like that. So I still don't have access either to my own file or to all documents that cover my, uh, contain my name and I, I suppose I'll never get it. So, um, that's real life West, Western world experience. Good. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I'm sorry? I should make a request to the NSA. Sorry, respond to either or both of these. You want to? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, David, if you're going to start asking philosophical questions on a Friday afternoon, there better be a bottle of whiskey involved. <laughs> and since you didn't provide it, I think the uh, request will be denied until uh, the whiskey is actually provided. I will use any excuse. No, I agree. The, I, I don't agree that getting rid of balancing, but I do believe that it should be within a framework, and that framework will cover a lot of cases. Officials' names should not be... You know, unless there is some particular threat to them, undercover officials, shouldn't be secret. Names of lobbyists should not be secret if they're corporate lobbyists, you know. Knowing who the Bavarian lager trio was uh, is not going to seriously uh, damage, damage their privacy. There are more difficult cases where it does get down to that. Hmm. No, for the stream, we're before, being streamed. So <laughs> Shout it out, and I'll repeat. In other words, you make a specific statement of claim. In this case, X should not or should be revealed. In other words, you've you've been the balancing principle. Thank you so much. Quad S. <laughs> You just um, don't want us to call it balancing. Something, so. uh, probing, whatever. You know, QED. Thank you so much, Helen. <laughs> QED. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave. <laughs> I don't think that was quite what I did, but no, sure. Right. And right. yes, Guido, that is European, the European Commission uh, is very good at giving away personal data uh, to the US government for, for SWIFT and all these other things. Not so good at giving it to the citizens. That is a... Uh, that is a problem that a lot of governments actually have, uh, U.S. government included. Uh, but that is, again, what we as open government advocates fight every day in every country, trying to make sure that we actually have that right of access to whatever it is that we should have that right of access to. So you have a, a, a real problem, and uh, it's something that many of us have fought for years with not a lot of success, but we will continue to fight it. Someday, we might even win. In the back there. <laughs> and then uh, over um, there, too. I think if open government and open data is a process where we find out how much our local council spends on trimming hedges, uh, but doesn't let us know how much our government is spending on huge server farms in Utah on tapping undersea cables. If it's a process where the government of Azerbaijan, for example, which is committed to open data, publishes data sets on what time trains will run at, but won't tell you how the president's daughter got a mobile phone license. If open government is essentially about giving us gigabytes of data, which is non-controversial, but hiding really, really controversial, information from citizens who make choices in a democracy, then this whole process is highly problematic. I think we need to ask really tough questions about, is open government 
because you know it, it, it's one of the buzzwords at the moment. If open government is so easy for states to sign on to, what are the tough bits? Which states shouldn't be joining? Which states aren't appropriate to be part of this partnership? And when it comes to the tough questions, when it comes to finding out more about surveillance, in Parliament yesterday, uh, the Minister shied away from telling members of Parliament about the scope of the Tempora programme. You know, if open government is a buzzword that shrouds uh, other, you know, a surveillance in mystery, then as civil society we have to be very, very cautious about the way that we engage with it. The, the chairman of the intelligence and uh, the, the chairman of the intelligence and security committee wouldn't even tell, tell Parliament if his committee had considered uh, those programmes before the Guardian uh, revealed them. Although one of the members of the committee re revealed that they had not. Other questions? Yes, sir. I am from Zimbabwe and I research on state surveillance and um, interceptions of communications in Africa. Um, I think, you know, from my own findings, I think maybe the major corporate is, you know, the business, you know, community. Because when you're looking at maybe what has been happening in Zimbabwe, you know, for example, um, you see Israeli company called, you know, Nikov, yeah. Uh, strengthening the technical capability of you know African governments, particularly autocratic uh, regimes, in not only spying on their citizens but also giving them technology that enables government to withhold information, like you know voter rolls and, and all that. So you know the normative framework that you're talking about, the optional protocol that you're talking about, that is being proposed by the Human Rights Council. Uh, to what extent is it going to do, address um, issues you know, relating to multinational corporations you know, violating human rights? And in your own view, how should it sit with you know, the current principles on human rights and, and business? And then the second question is about you know, the tensions between right to privacy and right to freedom of expression. I know Frank LaRue has covered you know, that area a, a lot, but I think looking at what's happening in the UK now, you know, the Royal Charter, in response you know, to the news of the world hacking, in my own view, I think, one, we say right to privacy is, con right to privacy is contingent to right to freedom of expression, but now we are seeing another tension where right to freedom of ex expression is a, a, in contradiction or is militating against you know, the right to privacy. And then we see the government you know, passing or a, a royal charter. What would be your comment? Is, isn't it that a contradiction? Isn't it too, you know, do, do, I, I think, overly proportionate or disproportionate response you know, just you know, to a few problems, minor problems? Are we not legislating our way out of a problem rather than simply addressing you know, the issue in terms of the levels and recommendations. Thank you. <coughs> yes, on, on your, first, uh, your first point, I think uh, I agree, a very important one, because so much of the uh, internet infrastructure is run by private companies, not by states. Traditionally, human rights obligations apply to states, not the private sector, and that's why the rookie principles on business and human rights that were agreed by the hum endorsed by the Human Rights Council and which are being further developed at the UN level. Also, Eu Europe has the European Commission has produced a specific guide for the ICT sector based on those principles, uh, which are which I think are very. Uh, positive. I think it's good that um, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo and Facebook through the Global Network Initiative with other companies and working with other stakeholders, not, not just the industry body members, have developed uh, their, their set of principles around how they all deal with human rights issues, particularly on transparency. Obviously, from what we know from over the summer, there are limits to that. If you have national laws, as, as is the case in the US, saying that some kinds of uh, access to user data just cannot be reported, that isn't going to work. And that's why I think we need to keep pressure on states as well as on those private sector companies to make sure that there are, there are not laws like that, that there are positive transparency obligations on the companies and on the governments themselves to be publishing that kind of data. This over here. Um, 
my name is Alison. I'm, I'm from South Africa. Um, what, I'm just wrestling with, with everybody's puzzlement about how to deal with these issues when the UN Convention on Human Rights and various, too many to mention, conventions since then have dealt with the issue of the right to freedom of expression, the right to privacy, and the right, perhaps more latterly, to, to access to information. And each of those rights have um, you know, many exegeses on them, what they mean, and there are points at which you do have to start looking at the, the fact that they do converge on each other. But it seems to me that particularly in relation to privacy, uh, the response to all of these issues around surveillance has really not been about the right to privacy uh, from authorities. The, the response from them has more been, well, look at what we can do and look at what we can collect and look at how we can protect you if we have all of this stuff, um, which is just not a rights-based response. And, and that, that, I think, is what puzzles me, is that there's not a rights-based response to this. Perhaps this is from because I'm from... Uh, the South, and we're more accustomed to talking about human rights, perhaps. I don't know if perhaps in the developed North this is no longer a tradition. But it's something that we, we do like to talk about. Um, and, and I just wonder why this is not more prominent in the debate. Yeah, let me respond to that, because I think it's not quite right. The, uh, the National Security Agency does assert for U.S. citizens and persons in the United States uh, that it does do a rights-based analysis and that it goes to great lengths to protect that information. Now, we all have doubts about how far they actually go, but there is a whole elaborate set of rules and regulations called minimization, but also limits on targeting uh, that purport to represent uh, the rights of persons in the United States. Well, and I was just going to say, but I think where, we, where it needs to change, where it doesn't exist, is in the rights to people who are not citizens of the country and who are not in the country. And that is, I think, for most people, and certainly for all governments, a very new notion uh, that governments have an obligation to respect the privacy rights, not only of people uh, in their country or under their jurisdiction, which is the language of the covenant on civil and political rights, but all people, or at least all people living in free societies. I think there's issues about where you draw these lines. But I think we've reached the point where that is now going to become a major issue, and I think we have an obligation to see that it becomes a major issue, and that all governments, not just the American government, because many other governments uh, collect data from citizens of all countries, and almost every government tries to do so. Uh, so I think we need to deal with this issue uh, on a universal basis. I don't know, do you want to say a word? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to say a couple of things. Um, one is uh, on the sort of private versus public thing. I think we see that um, private companies are being variously used by the state as an arm of surveillance. And I think that's very dangerous. It's dangerous for those companies and their reputations as well as for society at large because you can no longer tell what's the police what's the state and what is not. Uh, anything that you do online, it seems at some level, might end up in an NSA or GCHQ database uh, for some time. So you know, how, 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 is, how are you meant to make any judgments about that? Um, the tensions between privacy and free speech in general, I think you've got to sort of go uh, quite far down and look at what the area is in particular. And I think the, the problem with the surveillance debate is that the government posits that this is about our collective security versus your individual privacy, and on that level, it doesn't sound so uh, convincing that you know your personal, uh, you know some parts of your personal data really, sh you know that are they really worth sacrificing national security for? Clearly not. So therefore, the surveillance must take place. So I think you have to also I think you have to realise in the internet space particularly we are really talking about a balance of uh, not so much uh, privacy versus security, but individual uh, and business security uh, versus um, certain state security needs. And if you understand the balance like that, then you see why it's so out of kilter. 
Um, so I think we have to get beyond the rhetoric, basically, and, and look at what is really happening, what is really being suggested, and what the real benefits are, and what the real uh, problems for us are. Because I think once you get there, you realise, well, this, this, there is no point, actually, in gathering up these huge amounts of data on innocent people uh, just so that the NSA can... Uh, do certain investigations. They can probably do the vast majority of the investigations that they need um, without going through that by targeting people that they're actually bothered about. Um, there are many, many ways to do investigations. It doesn't mean that you have to sweep lots and lots of innocent people's data up uh, in order to conduct those. Yes, over here. Thanks very much. Helen Derbyshire from Access Info Europe. Thanks for the, the really interesting debate. I think it's been one of the better ones. We're getting into some meaty issues here. Um, and it's very important that we are addressing these issues in the context of the Open Government Partnership. I just had two comments briefly. One is, um, whilst I, I kind of agree with you, Alison, I do think that in Europe we are using the rights-based arguments very much. And I, I think that that's probably something that for a few years wasn't happening, but increasingly post 9-11, we, we are, and it's, it's very important to ensure that we root our discussions um, in right, human rights. And that was also something that was missing from the OGP at the beginning, and is increasingly coming in. Um, on the transparency pillar, we've had the uh, recognition just in the last few years that access to information is, as you said, a fundamental human right linked to our freedom of expression, protected by all those treaties, Universal Declaration and the regional treaties. That's terribly important, um, that we have a right to demand information. And that's, that's helping us advance transparency in, in Europe and at the level of the European Union. The EU is not perhaps quite as bad as Guido paints it, um, but sometimes one has to go to court. Access Info just had to take a case against the Council of the EU to court. Um, uh, so I, I, I very much endorse the, the idea that we should use these rights-based arguments. Uh, and the other thing just to say is that for those of you who haven't seen it yet, there is a letter going around, a sign-up letter um, on op uh, surveillance and open government, um, which is picking up a lot of signatures. If, you haven't, if you're not on one of the lists, let me know. But I think it's very important that a civil society and others, it's open to anyone to sign, we actually put a marker down and respond to some of these concerns. So just to let you know about that. Thank you. Okay. If, let me give the panel one final chance and we'll go in opposite order. Do you have anything final you want to say? Mm, well, probably I'll, I'll comment on um, this thing about uh, balancing, which... Uh, uh, you did not agree with, uh, well, it depends on what you think what balance is. There are some specific uh, criteria that we have regarding, for example, as what David said, information about public servants or public officers. I mean, regarding, obviously, their names, their posts, uh, their salaries, this has to be released, and that's a principle, well, in my country, right? So when it comes to something very specific, as I said, regarding the medical record of a public servant, then, well, there is where we balance. And balancing means, well, we have to bring forward uh, arguments saying why it should be released or why it should be kept <coughs> confidential. That is what, to me, balancing means. If the word is not properly used, well, I, I excuse myself. But anyway, that is what it means. It means bringing arguments for and against and, and then trying to come up with a definition about that. Thank you. Maybe I'll just follow up on that a bit, which is, uh, yes, I agree with David that we could possibly put together a list, but I don't agree that we could possibly put together a list that covered every single possible scenario, in which case we do need to have some framework at the end that deals with things that we don't consider. We do that already in freedom of information where we have public interest tests uh, for most of the exemptions in many laws so that we can address that kind of thing. Otherwise, we could have very long lists of here's everything that should be published, 
but it wouldn't address all those things that we don't know of that need to be published and that might have exemptions and how to deal with those exemptions. So it's relatively easy to get rid of a number of the what I would call dumb cases where officials try and claim that their privacy is invaded if it shows that they signed a memo or attended a meeting or did something like that, uh, but it can't address all the cases. Uh, so, yes, please. yeah, so just one uh, sort of final uh, remark, um, you know, just to say, we ob obviously we all have to find ways to exercise our rights, and uh, that's very important if these are going to be meaningful, and in the current uh, climate, part of that is about political action uh, and, and uh, political change, but also it's about using the courts. Um, and uh, a number of groups in the UK, as well as the US, the UK examples are less well known, but there are at least three or four different initiatives to attempt to test the current laws to see whether they are, um, in some cases, necessary and proportionate, in some cases, uh, in our case, whether the laws are sufficiently descriptive and easy to understand, um, and whether Ripper and, and so on really do uh, look as if they are going to provide the government with powers to do mass uh, surveillance, such as the Tempora program. Uh, so the Open Rights Group, English Pen, Big Brother Watch, and Constant Kurtz have uh, uh, got a case in with the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights, which we hope they will uh, take a look at to see whether they believe that the UK are acting in uh, accordance with human rights principles. It's, inf it's important that people do this kind of work to actually do put these cases forward, to do test the laws. Um, and then when, if, if and when we're successful, any of the groups that are doing this, um, if we are successful, that then we learn from that um, rather than just allowing the discourse uh, against human rights that comes from some quarters um, you know, to allow that uh, to undermine our perception of what, why it is that we have fundamental human rights. And I would very much agree with, with Jim with the point that Mike Harris made uh, from the audience that um, let's, let's be ambitious in what we're asking governments to sign up to here. Clearly, transparency is very important if people are going to know what's going on. They can't even start to test uh, the compatibility of these activities if they don't know they're going on. Um, I think transparency is very important, but not sufficient in itself. That's why the, the human rights framework, as, as Ellen said, remains so important. Um, sometimes the wheels, can wheels of justice can turn very slowly, as Jim said. Uh, but just, I, I think this is a nice quote to finish for me. Uh, Martin Shannon, who was the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counterterrorism um, until very recently, gave evidence to the European Parliament's inquiry into these matters just a couple of weeks back, and he said right at the start of his evidence, the short answer to the question of lawfulness is that both the United States and the United Kingdom have been involved and continue to be involved in activities that are in violation of their legally binding obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So, um, how, how that is tested, you know, not just in Europe, but at the, at the UN level, is an important question, but that's why discussions like today's, and ultimately, I mean, what Shane suggested to the European Parliament was that uh, because neither the US nor the UK allow individual complaints under that covenant, uh, they still do allow interstate complaints. So it would be open to one of the other signatory, uh, other parties to the covenant to actually take a complaint, which would then allow the Human Rights Committee to make that determination. Good. Well, I want to repeat what I said in the previous panel. My own view is that the case that this surveillance is covered by the covenant on civil political rights is a real stretch. And while it's fine to suggest that's one of the bases, I think we have to make it clear that we think that this kind of surveillance is wrong, that it violates the privacy of individuals throughout the world, that it's incompatible with building an open and just society, and it's incompatible with the basic notion of the open government partnership, which is clearly that states have an obligation not only to their own citizens, but to the citizens of other countries to respect uh, their, their privacy rights. I also want to suggest the need to balance before, uh, before we leave on the, uh, the right to, uh, to privacy in relation uh, to, uh, to the right to, uh, to civil liberties. I think uh, the only way to balance whether privacy rights should trump the public's right to know 
is to ask how important the information is to the public uh, and uh, to have the principle be that people are entitled to their privacy unless the public uh, is, entitled, is entitled to know. Uh, I think it's important as we think about this issue in the OGP context, not to get it to the point where we say if we, if we don't have pr surveillance discussed as a major issue, it, we should walk away from the OGP. I think clearly it has been important in pressing governments to release information on many other subjects, uh, and we should continue to do that. But I think at the same time, we need to clearly express the view, which I think many of us have, uh, that there is an obligation as well to deal with these issues, to deal with surveillance issues and privacy issues. And we need to press our own governments uh, to open the process for developing their action plan so that civil society plays a more active role. And we need to make sure that we use that opportunity uh, to press for commitments by governments in this area as well as others. Uh, let me thank you all for your attendance and uh, uh, this late in the program. Thank you.